Most of you will know me as Ian, Ian Freeman. In fact, I'm Paul Bitchman tonight because he's been taken off unwell. So I've taken over his welcoming duties, um, which will therefore be very brief because I'm on for the late show come thank you time. <laughs> uh, but it gives me great pleasure to... Um, uh, Afina Mai? Afi Mai. Mai and Afi Mai to uh, our two lovely women here. I saw them late this afternoon slinking up Victoria Road. <laughs> Drenched! In, in, the, in the company of Olive, their guide dog. Oh. <laughs> and oh, I thought so to good. myself as they crossed the pedestrian crossing, if one of our Devonport hoons was to come screaming up here, New Zealand poetry would be not for a sex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, so, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Olive, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, we do bid you welcome to the Devonport uh, Library Associates, and this is a joint um, event with the Michael King Writer's Studio, and I'd like to call on Lynn to say a few words about that. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. I won't use one of those things. I'll just come no. over here so everybody can see me. You will all be knocked by for a six by these two women I know tonight. <laughs> and I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the Michael King Writer's Centre to say thank you so much to all the people who came to 20 Poets in Devonport. We had 20 Poets in Devonport. And for those of you who contributed to the lines and the slogans, we are coming up with an ode to Devonport and we'll keep you posted on that. And um, just to tell you about our next um, event, which is Goodbye Māori Land, how music, New Zealand music was transported across the world to Europe during mm. World War I, a book mm. that's to be launched by um, Tim Finn on behalf of Chris Burke, the writer. That happens during the Heritage Festival on October the 15th. Mm. Thank you, and I know, thank you, I have to say thank you to Selena. I had a little request of Selena and she's played ball. <laughs> thank you all, mm. enjoy, thank you. Mm -hmm. Michelle, that's you. That's me. Mm. Wow. Kia ora, everybody. Kia ora. I'll put that on. Oh, that's, that's better, isn't it? Yeah. Good. yeah. Welcome, 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 Selena, back to Devonport. Mm -hmm. Devonport has been a place where Selena's been a lot in terms of poetry over the last eight or nine years. And it's wonderful to be able to invite her back for the second launch of yeah. this tightrope. Okay, tightrope is now launched in Devonport. Yeah. We just did it. Anybody who's got their copy, please hold it up. How many copies are we looking at? Oh, by the end of the evening, you'll be able to purchase your own copy and have it signed by the poet. Please do. Great. Okay, um, here's how we've got the evening planned. Um, we're going to, I'll make some brief introductory remarks about Selena. And then basically, I'm going to hand it to her because she knows how to work a crowd and she's got a new book. And this is a chance for us to really go with a poet into a new book. This is the kind of launch that actually gives the poet a chance to take a journey through the book, not just a few little bits and pieces. We've got her for about 45 minutes, so we're planning to stop around about 8.15, which will give everybody a chance then until 8.30 to have questions, responses, um, you know, throw things at her, 
Que questions, <laughs> questions. Let's throw things at her, et cetera. Um, and then 8.30 until 9, it's milling around, buying books, signing books, etc. And then I believe the doors close at 9 o'clock. Okay, Selena Tusitala Marsh, my colleague and my very dear friend. This is the third book since 2009. The first was the much acclaimed Fast Talking P.I. 2009. It went to the stars and it came back again and it went round the world and it came back again. In 2013 came the second book, Dark Sparring. Now in 2017, 25th of August, the Falle over at the University of Auckland, she launched Tightrope, the third book. And it's a really difficult book, the third book. The second one is difficult, but the third one, oh, you know, you've really got to pull out something. Well, she has. I'd read Tightrope before it was launched and I knew that we were on to something. But the other thing she pulled out that day, the 25th of August, was being made the Poet Laureate of New Zealand for 2017-19. Yay, Selena! It, it was, for those of you who were at the Falle that day, it was the most incredible occasion. Not only a book launch and the Falle full of people, but the surprise announcement that it was Selena who was going to be our next Poet Laureate. Selena, we're so proud of you. We really are. Okay, um, Selena and I had a talk about you know, how we could make this journey through the book. And I had a really good idea. I said, um, Selena, on the back of your book and on the poster for this Devonport reading, there's a whole lot of stuff by David Elton. There's a whole lot of adjectives there that he's got lined up. And Selena, how about you read us that list of adjectives and then I'll ask you for a poem that matches every single one of them. Excellent. Would you like to read these adjectives? Oh, okay, all right. So, uh, Here's, this was my first idea. So David says, Selena Tusitala Marsh draws on nursery rhymes, riddles, spells, Pacifica chants, popular song, rap, as well as on high modernist and postmodernist literature to produce a new collection that is spiky, okay, this is the bit. Okay. spiky. spiky and fierce, brash and vital, by turns comic, irreverent, poignant, rhapsodic, anthemic, Confrontational. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could actually spend the next 45 minutes like, you know, give us the spiky one, where's the confrontational? I thought you had a comedic one there somewhere. An anthemic one? Anyway, um, then I released her from that idea because I don't think that's really where we want to go. So the idea of being able to explore tightrope, it's new, okay, it's exciting, it hasn't really been explored in the kind of depth that we're going to be able to hear tonight. If you've got this book, you will know that it's been, it's, it appears in three parts, and when you open up the contents page, you find that the first section is called Abyss, and the second section is called Tightrope. And the third section is called Trek. And those three terms are taken from a very important quote that also appears on the back of the book. And it's the notion that a book is going to take you from the abyss to the tightrope to the trick that really, really appeals to me. And so that's my challenge to Selena. Take us on that journey, Selena, and let's see where we get to. Over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, kia ora koutou, talo for lava, bula vanaka, ma loi lele, kia ora na, whakalofa lahi atu, namaste, g'day mate. <laughs> so good to see you here this evening. Thank you for supporting the book. I have with me um, the matua toko toko, the parent walking stick, talking stick that the poet laureate um, 
gets to have in their possession until their own toko toko is carved for them um, by a wonderful artist and carver from Matahiwi Marae in the Hawke's Bay, Jacob Scott. This was in Michelle's possession in, what was the year, Michelle? 2007 to 9. 2007 to 9. It's in my possession until March. Um, it is both male and female, father and mother. And one of the stories about it is that this bit in the middle, it comes apart, it's in three pieces, so we'll travel. <laughs> um, it's going to Samoa at the end of November. Um, so this bit in the middle has a cavity and inside the cavity is a handwritten poem by former poet laureate Hone Tufare. Oh, a handwritten poem and apparently of quite erotic nature. <laughs> so Jacob the carver also carved a male component to the toko toko which is this end bit. Um, and it's apparently he, yes, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> um, and apparently he rubbed this part, the male part, across the female part and helped poetry make fire. <laughs> so usually mātua toko toko or in Samoan we have the to'o to'o, the orator's staff. And it is a staff that um, gives one the mana and the authority to speak on behalf of a community. Um, and usually this is behind a glass case in the National Library. But then Michelle came along and she took it out into the community. And uh, before I return it, it was my goal to get a thousand pairs of hands to touch the toko toko and imbue the toko toko with your energy, your mana, because Polynesians believe that innate objects hold mana, right? And so where I go, the matua, the parents follow, and I've taken it out to the community and I've got about 750 pairs of hands who've already touched the toko toko, and so I'm going to do well over a thousand by the time I return it to March. So. What I'd like to do during the performance is to give it to you, give you a chance to stroke it. Fondle it. Fondle it. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look at its beauty and bestow your creative energy on it. And then after, I want to take a big selfie group photo with the toko toko in the middle so I can post it up on the Poet Laureate blog. So here you go. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, about um, in, about the early 90s, I've read something that Moalai Vau Albert Rent, Went had written. And you know how sometimes you read a line and it just becomes a little worm in your brain and won't quite let you go? Well, this quote captured my imagination. It seemed to talk to me at that specific time and keeps talking to me. And so he wrote in the late 80s, and Albert's background is as a historian. We are what we remember. The self is a trick mm -hmm. of memory. History is the remembered tightrope that stretches across the abyss of all that we have forgotten. And for me, the tightrope symbols that throwing across time and space and memory to walk an identity line, but also to walk the line. Because life, as I've grown up, has become increasingly demanding balancing act. So I'm going to read two poems the first from Abyss, because the abyss of all we've forgotten, the darkness, death, the great existential void, and the opening poem to Tightrope. Oh, actually, I'm just going to share with you the um, acceptance speech that I performed at the launch um, 
when uh, I was bestowed the Poet Laureate Award because of course it, it came in poetry form and um, and it's always the response that I, I kind of chant to the matua toko toko. <clears throat> I accept this award on behalf of the 10-year-old at St. Joseph's Otahuhu, who found a word to rhyme with monocle. <laughs> I accept this award on behalf of writers in schools whose powers are bionicle. <laughs> I accept this award on behalf of Pacifica peoples whose brown faces aspire to higher places. I accept this award on behalf of women whose hypothetical babies are born during political races. That's for you, Jacinda. <laughs> I accept this award on behalf of working class who press against windows of priv privilege. I accept this award on behalf of tangata whenua. Without land, you know it takes a village. I accept this award on behalf of those for whom poetry induces vomit. Mm -hmm. I will woo you with haiku, poetry slam, rhyming couplet, sonnet. I accept this award on behalf of mum, who spoke no English when she came here from Samoa. As her daughter, I accept the award of New Zealand Poet Laureate. Quite poetic. Don't you think, Aotearoa? <laughs> so here's a, a dark place, a kind of abyss in Samoa. Talimatau is my husband's village. The dogs of Talimatau. My son finds a tail on the lawn Sorry, Olive. A paw on the drive, a snapped off jaw round the back by the washing line. The night before, in heat, we'd heard Max, Four, Lima, and Ono, knotted fur, nettling bones, fat eyes, fat hunger, snapping, snarling. In the morning, we opened the back door, parting sooty veils of flies to find a hind leg, half a head, the bloated innards of another dog. However that dog died, probably on the road, however long ago, at least two days, Max for Lima and Ono sniffed out its decayed meat, dragged it home and in pecking order began to eat. Lords of Pu'uli Uli. Hot stench makes us gag. Slamming the door on the buzzing swarm, we yell for uncle, who dons his navy blue work overalls, grabs a spade. Don't worry, I take it. Good, bury it deep, we think. We watch through blinds as uncle divides the black sea, scoops up head, carcass, tendon, threaded leg, and standing by the neighbor's fence, hefts the lot over. <laughs> <laughs> In old time, the high chief, they eat the enemy. Max for Lima and Ono, they like the high chief. In New Zealand, uncle had one dog for years, Max. Then in Samoa, three dogs all named Max, <laughs> who died one by one mysteriously. 
The three preceding maxes were poisoned, according to uncle, staring at the neighbor's fale. After Max five finished foaming at the mouth, convulsing, uncle went to think out loud in front of the neighbor's house. You know, dogs are like the people. They have thinking like the people, feeling like the people, spirit like the people. I know God love the dogs. I know that if this happen again, he will strike down not the mans who do this terrible thing, but the grand chillin of the mans because that is what the dogs like to me, grand chillin. Anyway, have a good day, ah <laughs> yeah. Max, four, Lima and Ono lie in the shade of the cookhouse, eating papaya skin, banana peel, soured koko more left over two minute beef noodles, but their favorite, according to uncle, is the one tala bread from Farmer Joe's. Uncle so proud of the smartness of his dog, one loaf lasts them the whole week. <laughs> Some of you might be uh, familiar with Philippetti, the great tightrope walker who walked between the, was it the Twin Towers? Yes. Yeah. Twin, yeah. Twin, twin Towers. So this um, poem is about Philippe and me. It's called Le Coup. When I was three and breaking the law by placing one foot in front of the other, never looking down or back, just straight ahead on the seven foot pool fence in Avondale. In New York, Philippe Petit was breaking the law, placing one foot in front of the other, never looking down or back. 1,350 feet above the earth, between the twin towers, ambulating back and forth, eight times as the world held its breath for the death-defying art criminal, one week shy of 25. Philippe flexing along the petite wire, tongues the air, chews humidity, tasting to see if rain is there or not there. A cloud burst would wash away his life, illegal alien, illicit street juggler tossing about in the mists. Air choreographer winds back inertia and time, not a circus tent in sight, just curtains of art and opera rising, the theatre of poetry beginning as Philippe scores the line. Siren. My mother's name is Sai Lingi, Samoan for siren. Born in Apia, September 44, on the night the sirens, mother, daughter, screamed. One year after Olaf Friedrich Nelson died, one year before American allies dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima. Diamond ring on her hand, passport in the other, two decades later she leaves for New Zealand. Dad waits in Avondale with my three Māori half-brothers. He failed to mention them to my 21-year-old mother. <laughs> in Emma Leal's bar on Beach Road, Apia. 
On Avondale Road, evacuations soon began as the first of many sirens rang, leaving me and my sister in the emptying house to sing. We won the war in 1944 because 1945 did not rhyme. <laughs> My poor brothers. <clears throat> Explanation of poetry to my immigrant mother. This is for Glenn, as in Glenn Calhoun, and he has a poem that I mimicked and then changed radically. <laughs> ma, ma, sometimes a poems like the dawn raids. 2 a.m. door pounding, blue uniformed belligerents checking under beds in closet for illegal rhythms, overstaying rhymes. Even cupboards are cleared for evidence. An extra pair of adjectives might give away the real number of lines living in this poem. Or ma, a poems like learning English from Stefano de Mera and Marlena as their days become our days, like sands through the hourglass, language staged in the click of tongue, cock of brow. Or like when Selwyn Toogood yells, is it the money or the bag? And the poem every time chooses the bag, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Or the poems like the flea market at Avondale Racecourse, car boot mouths gaping, orange paisley silk, ochre itchy wool slung over the side waiting to be inhaled by the wind's throat. Or ma, ma the poems like the kids lucky dip bin, love, grief, rage wrapped in headlines, bow tied with rippling alliteration, guesses up for grabs. Or ma, a poems like one of those government schemes set up by Paddy Walker in the 50s. Someone had wrapped wood in the Sunday news and lit a fire in the oven. So they ran classes about how to set the poem's knobs, how to ignite its hob, how the, how the poem's mouth begins to roast the day's meat. Or how the poem is a passport can translate the, transit the likeness of you from New Lynn to New Tao, fending off heat and mosquitoes, how its sound and image, its push and pull can launch you across lined waters where in another country you find yourself home. So I'm going to read you the Queen sequence from the middle section called Tightrope. And um, in 2016, I was instated as the Commonwealth poet. Ooh. And part of that role was to write and perform a poem for the Queen in, West in Westminster Abbey as part of Commonwealth Observance Day. And this is an event that she set up in 1953. It is the Queen's gig. She never misses one. Mm -hmm. And um, this, so, you know, she would be there and the Duke of Edinburgh would be there and other members of the royal family. And it was a tight rope for me because as a poet who has the word Allah in my middle name of Tusi Tala, and Allah being the proto-Polynesian word for path or bridge. This was an extraordinary opportunity to be a path and a bridge and to represent Waiheke, New Zealand, Tuvalu, Samoa, Oceania, you know, on that stage. But of course, it didn't escape me that this was the heart of the British Empire you know, our former colonizers. And so it was a little bit problematic. <laughs> the tightrope was also um, a balancing act for me because 
they had certain rules in place about the composition and there were five rules and I thought well I teach creative writing I love creative writing exercises they just make our poetic muscles stronger bring it what are they so the first rule that it had to be called unity because the Queen had sets the theme every year and this one was unity among the Commonwealth the second rule was that um, it had to somehow represent the 53 member nations of the Commonwealth who would all be in attendance through their representatives. Right? And so there would be 53 flags like lining Westminster Abbey, which was very cool. I thought, yes, I could do that. I love acrostic poems. I'll just, you know, begin a line with each country's beginning letter and we'll see where we go from there. And the third rule was that it had to be under three minutes because BBC were performing it live, they've got tight time restrictions. I thought, wow, okay, maybe I could do that. The fourth rule was that it had to appeal to nine-year-olds because there were a whole heap, there were about a thousand school children from across the UK coming. It would be the Queen's guests and were in attendance. Nine-year-olds to, I think, the Prince of Edinburgh was turning 96. So it had to appeal to school children and then general public, dignitaries, the monarchy, and who else would be there? <laughs> it was like, okay, impossible, of course not. <laughs> um, and the fifth rule, what was the fifth rule? The fifth rule that it would be subject to palace censorship because the poem was not allowed to be political. And kind of that's when the air deflated because I thought, wow, this was a global platform for me and my global climate change and you know anti-colonialism all the way and how is I going to do that now in three minutes, in less than three minutes with all those rules. And so um, I promptly got writer's block for about two months. And then in January, and the poem was due in February because they needed a month to censor it, should it need to be censored. Um, in January, I went to my kitchen and I wiped the big bench clear. I put a huge, I put a big A3 um, piece of paper down. I got out my black vivid, you know, the because they helped me be vivid. I love that joke. I will not let that go. <laughs> and I wrote, I wrote the word unity. I wrote the title in the middle and put a big circle around it. And I walked around the bench, and I thought, okay, nine-year-olds to ninety-nine-year-olds. Inclusivity, um, apolitical, representative. Well, I couldn't be apolitical, and neither could you if you tried, right? Because we all come from a, a position and a space. And the reason I'd gotten writer's block was because I was trying to write a poem that I thought they would want, instead of just kind of sitting with me and letting the story out. And then I saw the two lines around which the whole poem would build itself. There's a you and an I in unity. Wow. Costs the earth and yet it's free. So I walk up, I'm standing on the Sacrarium steps. Her Majesty is right where the gorgeous Professor Helen Sword is. I'll let you answer that. I'm majestic like that. <laughs> so Her Majesty is actually, could you be your, Her Majesty, because you're in blue and she was in blue and I was in blue and it was very, we were sinking. Um, next to the Duke and Wills and Kate and Prince Andrew and lots of dignitaries on this side, including Kofi Annan and his wife and David Cameron and very famous people that I misrecognise afterwards, but that's another story. <clears throat> And I begin, unity. Let's talk about unity here in London's Westminster Abbey. Did you know there's a London in Kiribati? Ocean Island, South Pacific Sea. We're connected by currents of humanity, alliances, allegiances, colonial histories. For the salt in the sea, like the salt in our blood, like the dust in our bones, our final return to mud 
means though 53 flags fly for our countries, they're stitched from the fabric of our unity. It's called the Va in Samoan philosophy. What you do affects me. What we do affects the land, sea, wildlife. Take the honeybee, nature's model of unity, pollinating from flower to seed. Bees thrive in hives, keeping their queen. And at this point, I look down at Her Majesty. <laughs> she looks up from her booklet. Unity keeps them alive, keeps them buzzing. <laughs> They're key to our fruit and veggie supplies, but parasitic attacks and pesticides threaten the bee, then you, then me. It's all connected. That's unity. There's a you and an I in unity. Costs the earth and yet it's free. My granddad's from Tuvalu. And to be specific, it's plop bang in the middle of the South Pacific. The smallest of our 53 Commonwealth nations. The largest in terms of reading vast constellations. My ancestors were guided by sky and sea trails. And way before Columbus even hoisted his sails. What we do now matters to those who go before. We face the future with our backs, sailing shore to shore. For we're earning and saving for a common wealth, a common strong body, a common good health. Means saving the ocean, means saving the bee means London and the UK, seeing London and the South Seas, and sharing our thoughts over a cup of tea. <laughs> There's a you and an I in unity, costs the earth, and yet it's free. Thank you. <laughs> So when we met uh, the royal family um, after the event, the Queen said, um, it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I was instructed, so I, I could either curtsy or shake her hand. I thought, I'm shaking this woman's hand. Okay. <laughs> um, and then she said, how did you memorise it all? <laughs> I said, it's my job, Your Majesty, I'm a poet. <laughs> Later on that evening, we were invited, the performers were invited to Marlborough um, Palace. And again, I met Your Majesty, and this time I spoke um, at some length to the Duke of Edinburgh. And so, I'm wearing this blue, and the Queen is wearing her blue, and in a sea of black and beige. I'm the only one with big hair. So he comes up to me and he says, I said, um, good evening. <laughs> um, and he said, he says, what do you do? <laughs> I said, I'm a poet. <laughs> and he replies, yes, yes, but what do you do? <laughs> So I said, I'm a lecturer at, lecturer at the University of Auckland, specialising in post-colonial literature. <laughs> <laughs> to which he pauses, looks askance, and replies, post, <laughs> and then moves on down the line. <laughs> So lots of really interesting things happened to me, you know, that whole week, including having my own manservant. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, more about that later. Um, <laughs> 
but it is 20 minutes before the big event, 20 minutes before the royal party are due to enter Westminster Abbey, 20 minutes before the big trumpets sound, and you know, you just kind of like, oh, I've seen this on TV so many times, the pomp and the pageantry, and and the, 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 the momentous occasion, right? And there are two empty seats um, next to me. And a verger, who is a church official, um, escorts an elderly couple in. And let me remind you that I am seated um, front row. Directly across from me are the heads of state, including Sir Lockwood Smith and Lady Alexandra, the then New Zealand High Commissioners and diagonally to me will be the royal family. And, you know, so I'm very visible and the cameras are everywhere. And so this elderly couple sit down next to me and I give them time to settle. I'm so excited, you know, and I didn't realise I was even sitting next to a UK pop star because I said to her, oh, so what do you do? And she goes, oh, I sing. <laughs> she said, what do you do? I'm a poet. It turns out to be Ali Goulding who's, yeah, hello. I know, I, I, my students just mocked me so badly after that. <laughs> and so I give them time to settle and I turn and I say, hello, I'm Selena, the poet from New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> and he looks at me and he looks down at my hand and he looks straight ahead and he says, yes. Oh. And so, <clears throat> I turn it into a bit of a yoga stretch and just think, you know, it's pre-performance, I'm just stretching and I think, okay, nobody saw, nobody saw, don't let it take your focus off. I look directly across to where he's looking and I see Lady Alexandra poke her head out and she mouths to me. <laughs> Did you see that? Did this side see that? Yeah. <laughs> So, and I've shared this story before, but you know, wherever I've travelled in the world, there is a common poet's proverb that translates into English as, never piss off a poet. <laughs> so here's my poem, <laughs> but it's an interactive one. So who knows the nursery rhyme, pussycat, pussycat? Yeah. Okay, so the first lines go, pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? Yeah. yeah. And then the second question asked is, Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you wear? Okay, so when I point to you, could you ask me the first one and I'll respond? And then when I point to you again, ask me the second one and I'll respond. Okay, all right, this is called Pussycat. Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the Queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what did you wear? I frightened the Western world with my big hair. <laughs> <laughs> my Moana blue mena, my plantation house shawl, my power orb, my New Zealand drawl, my Sivasa more hands, my blood red lips, my va philosophizing, my poetic brown hips, <laughs> then standing before Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh, I scented Polynesian navigation, making sure to be poetically thorough and proposing a timeline, inverting West is best, instead drawing a circle encompassing all the rest. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> I've got two minutes left. Um, I think you can have three or four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, um, would you like um, kind of semi serious, deep, or funny? Funny. Funny? 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 Okay, all right. So, <laughs> so semi serious, deep is um, Queens I Have Met, and it's a poem about meeting. Uh, Dr. Ngahuya Te Awakotuku, who was a queen in my world, about meeting Her Majesty, about meeting Alice Walker, about nearly meeting Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to finish off reading a poem from the trick section. And if you're a mum, 
you will understand how tricky life can get. If you do anything else but write poetry and read books, you will understand how tricky life can get. <laughs> so this poem is called The Working Mother's Guide to Reading 70 Books a Year. <laughs> So a poet, a Texan-based poet that I admire very much, very much, said that everyone should read 70 books a year. This is while he was on tour and his wife had just given birth to their six-week baby. And I thought, mm -mm -mm, you don't get away with that, no matter who you are. <laughs> the Working Mother's Guide to Reading 70 Books a Year. Don't have the babies. <laughs> Don't have a full-time job. Don't be working class. Don't be time poor and extended family rich. <laughs> if you did have the babies, don't let them play sports. <laughs> Definitely don't let them play an instrument. Extramural activities increase peak hour traffic commuting time. <laughs> Have a partner, but only if they don't mind not seeing you. <laughs> Definitely put a bookshelf in Nana's room to handle the overflow of washing, <laughs> not books. If you did need that full-time job, Put your foot down and don't work past 5 p.m. Yeah. Don't need much sleep. If you are working class, do read about all the reading working class people do. Like Jeanette Winterson, who hid 77 paperbacks under her ever-rising single bed mattress until her torch-bearing mother spied an overhanging leaf, which turned into a branch, which turned into a tree laden with leaves and leaves and leaves, which mother, doing God's gardening, pulled up by the roots, dragged into the midnight yard and lit. A bonfire of words and urds and urds and and as the smoke stung her eyes, Jeanette inhaled its burning kiss, vowing to commit the stories to memory, then vowed one better, I'll write my own. Read at half time when the water boy runs on the field skipping. Read one handed in line at countdown while lifting. Read in the car waiting for the coach to finish his speech on quitting. Read in the kitchen while the crock pot's stewing. Read on the handbag Kindle while it's charging. Read knowing it's not a competition. Read poetry, read creative non-fiction. And even if it takes you a whole year, read a novel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was glorious, Selena. Yeah, yeah. Her. And I have to say, she's done it perfectly, okay? I said, you know, we'd look into all three bits, all three sections, but she's left us with two and a bit, so we have to go and read the rest of the book. <laughs> okay, um, let's, let's have some questions, responses from the floor, and I'm going to call Selena up because she can see you and I can't. Oh, I must say, I love this book because when I pick it up, I know which is the front cover because it's got the beautiful little embossed type tightrope. <laughs> so I am no danger of holding it up and saying, tightrope, and it's upside down and back to front. <laughs> These are some problems. Right, 
Questions, responses from the floor. Is there anything you need to know from this woman? <laughs> Yours. I, I just want to say, my, it's a response. I've laughed so much, and especially with the thing about London and all that sort of thing, absolutely <coughs> just blew me away. So this is the way you um, use the language is, is it's magical, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, so thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Mm. Well, I'd like to say that I tried. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jen. Oh. We, we love it when people cry, <laughs> when we read and Thank they you, cry. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Hearing you, I feel I'm in the lucky country. Oh. Oh. Uh, I want to ask you, how long it took you to uh, write the preeminent poem for the brief and whether any of the word was censored by the Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, did you pass? Yes. Did you pass? Yes. Yes. Well, well, actually, um, so when I say I had writer's block, it didn't mean that I sat on my royalist hands. So I did a lot of research about the monarchy, about the Commonwealth as an organisation, about Westminster Abbey, you know, what had happened inside there. And so... All, while I'm collecting information, all these ideas are percolating and all the languages, kind of the potential language is sitting there. So that poem actually came out, you know, a rough draft on that day where I saw that there's a you and an I in unity costs the, world, that costs the earth and yet it's free. And then I had about four weeks to just work it and work it. And m my process is very oral. So, you know, my, my sons are totally used to me walking around reciting to nobody in my cell, you know, just, just kind of in my, in my cell, in my bedroom. <laughs> you know. And so, so yeah, about, about four weeks. And um, the palace census returned it completely clean, which is really Victory. amazing, right? <laughs> to be able to, you know, because it was, it was story, you know, and it was heart, and I wasn't beating anyone over the, the head, and it was just, because I thought they'd have me up on colonial histories, or, um, you know, the bees, right? Um, mm. But then, how are bees political? You know, I mean, you know, it's not like I was siding with any particular party on the issue, you know, it's like, but, but the poem hopefully was in, well, was inclusive, you know, it was to return to their Allah, that bridge. And I wanted to take everybody with me. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Comments, yes, yes. This is not really about you, but the other poems that day, did any of them strike you as being really special? I mean, I thought. Oh, thank you. Were there you. any as good as you? Well, of course not. No. I can say no because mine was the only one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, so there was so one. Special. There was there's one poem, you know, for the Queen on behalf of the Commonwealth. Wow. There's one song, and there was one um, musical kind of wow. item. Yes. And actually, a former student was my guest. That's April. Say hi, April. April from Devonport. Yes, yes. I was like, I don't know. Because they said, bring a guest. And I was like, I don't know anyone in England. But actually, I did. And it was April. <laughs> so she took a train from... Leeds. Leeds. Leeds, yeah. It was wonderful. It's really great to see another Kiwi in the audience. It, you'd, you'll never know how much that helped calm me down. Because... You reminded me that this, you know, home, even though I'm in the heart of the British Empire, yeah. I'm home and I'm a Kiwi and I'm a New Zealander and I'm, a, you know, yeah. And I'm Selena. Mm. It's so good that you could share it. Post. Yes, Ian. Post, yeah. <laughs> yes, Ian. <laughs> Is the Allah, the Allah in yes. Tusitala, the same as the 
Ara in Te Ara Roa. Yes, it is. If it means pathway, it's like because there are certain, yes, yeah. Te yeah. Ara, our encyclopedia, is yes. Ala is Ara, it's the same word. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. I suspect it so. Māori is A-R-A, -A, Ara, mm. and the Samoan is Ala, A-L-A, yeah. so it's the so same, same word. My point is that you, Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You are. Good, good, yeah. good. Yeah. You walk the, that path, which is the path from North Cape to the Bluff. Mm -hmm. And you walk it in the cathedral. Thank you. Thank you. Come give me a hug. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it would be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> then to Selena, I think you should finish with the unleashed. Another question? Two questions? Yes. Among the technical question, you know, when you're writing new poems, how many edits? Is there a lot of editing that goes on, or just do we need just come to you and we don't have to touch it after? Very few poems have come fully formed, fully burst. Um, there's always tweaking, and some just disappear, and some never make the page at all, actually. So the, so what I was saying before about the editing process for me is that I'll recite lines as I'm running, as I'm, you know, in the car. They have to sound right, and they have to sound, they have to resonate in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'll do an exercise, and there might be something in that exercise that I think, oh, I could actually replace that word with that, or shift that line, or create that space, or what does this poem look like with this kind of lineation, or this kind of gap? So I'm not afraid to actually shake up the whole poem if it just feels like it's not moving in the direction that I want to, and you should never be afraid to do that, yeah. And multiple versions ongoing all the time. But this performance, is actually the best way for me to know whether a poem has found its own home. It does make a big difference, doesn't it, when you hear it out loud? Yeah. Because even though you guys are really friendly, in my mind you're really not. Yeah. And so <laughs> you're judging every single you know, word and kind of intonation and pause and gap. So it has to, you know, it has to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you were saying that you started, I did a bit of, bit of uh, research on colonial experiment. <laughs> They're really unique. I mean, I've, I've seen them in different places. The books that are written on, say, different islands or even about the New Zealand people, but not intended to be read by by us, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like our Maori, right? Yeah. So it's written by a European or English, whatever, about the Maori people, and um, they, well, they weren't supposed to end up here. You know, this is, I've come across it. Have you ever come across many of those? Oh, um, absolutely. Like my area of specialty is um, first wave Pacific woman poets who published the sole collection of poetry in English and they've been around since the early 70s and yet I'd never heard of them. So part of my kaupapa at university is to, you know, bring those lost histories, lost her stories into the light and kind of give them the kind of attention that they deserve is so because people who talk above the heads of others they're they're, they're actually just addressing each other they're not actually speaking to the, the I wasn't quite meaning that I, I understand what you mean what I was meaning is to say okay the queen and you know her consultants and that talking about all oh, right this is what we're going to do with these people or whatever, but, and it's not intended to be, to see them turn. It's written purely for, for them over there, mm -hmm. but they happen to have turned up in, you say, New Zealand, yeah. across a few of them. Yeah. Well, th this was the challenging thing about accepting, um, accepting that, that role of Commonwealth poet, and it's always a decision whether to engage or safely disengage because you don't want to be part of that. Um, 
and someone did share with me, one, one person criticised me for accepting um, the, the role, um, but it was ironic that this also was a person who was the recipient of a Rhodes Scholarship and had studied at Oxford for six years. You know, so I think that for me, it was, it, it was right for me to stand in that space and engage and be a pathway. Yeah, yeah. But totally, totally understand those for whom it's, it's a no-go zone. Yeah. But that story about um, Prince Philip and that post, you know, I took it to a Commonwealth conference in South Africa and it sparked off, like it was so funny, it was very humorous, but, but also it was like, well, this is the kind of thinking that we continue to struggle against, mm -hmm. you know. But it, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for that. There was there a question here? Yeah. I just want to respond to Ian's beautiful response to, <laughs> to your poem. And I think that's a wonderful human connection, which um, I think probably we all felt. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it was like with your beautiful poem, Unity, um, to deliver that beautiful recipe for governance <laughs> to those who govern. Yeah. <laughs> and then to have that response from the Queen, very nice. But you wrote it for nine-year-olds to 90-year-olds, and, and um, I wonder what other responses, perhaps more favourable responses, you got from the people who heard you speak that day. Well, you know, with, with a poem like that, you have to road test it. So I road tested it um, at a school with 1,500 pupils, um, a first, an early draft anyway. And then I said to them, did you like it? You don't have to say yes. In fact, if you say no, I welcome that, you know. And they said, we really liked it. I said, what parts spoke to you? And they said, when you talked about your grandfather and when you talked about the bee. Because that's what we learn at school. You know, we know how important bees are. And we really love that you brought your grandfather with you and that he was a really cool navigator, you know. So but they got it. So they got it. They got it. The Duke didn't get it, but they got it. You know? <laughs> Post. We were going to do a lot of posts. Yeah. That's right. We were going to, at the Commonwealth um, Conference, Michelle had given me the idea to, you know, because the Commonwealth representatives were there, she gave me the idea to record people from representative nations just saying one word, and that would be... Post. Post. <laughs> post. We would post it back. And we would post it back. <laughs> There's another question, yes? May I? Uh, courageously suggest whether you would give your your gifts to the country by writing a poem similar to Unity to the coalition uh, talk when before they have their meeting. Your poem is read to with the, in the meeting room. I think it would actually brings up uh, a lot uh, in their. I, I agree that, you know, a, a um, fellow poet of mine, Kathy Jetnil Kijina from the Marshall Islands, um, delivered a spoken word poem on global, global climate change at the UN and she received the standing ovation. It was so moving, the story of her island and the impact of, you know, on her baby daughter. Um, and so through story, she managed to get everybody there standing together in unity to respond. So if you can pull a full, few strings, I'm open to that. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think you need any string. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You just have to do it. A tightrope. A tightrope. Thank you. Can you read another one? Selena, why don't we finish with the last poem in the book? Okay. Because that... Kind of ties a lot of things. Yes, because together. Ian, you, you mentioned tip to toe and kaipurianga and the leap off point for spirits. And there is um, a place in Hawaii called Kaina, which is the northernmost tip of Oahu, and that is where it's believed that the spirits leap off there. And so I'd visited their beautiful wild um, wildlife nature reserve. Kaina, leaping point. Oahu, Hawaii. Albatross toss about in the wind above my head. 
They play with air currents. I play with myth. Their chicks not yet mobile. Flick flecked beaks up and down near the round monk seals. Slabs of silver velveteen sunning nearby yellow faced bees ease into low lying salmon colored ohai. Beyond salty mists, whales breach then burst, spouting stars in the sky. I stand on the shores, jutting tableau tongue. I am a vowel. Ah, wide armed, open mouthed. Ah, in, into the va. A breeze carries sacred echoes back, but not mine, not yet. I am still unlit. Thank you so much. I will sign your books should you choose to buy. <laughs> and thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lynn, for leaping on me. Yeah, she did. <laughs> during a an event that I was on a high and I just said yes, yes, yes. And she mm -hmm. said, please wear the dress, wear the dress. So yeah. thank you, Lynn, for the invitation. And thank you, Devonport Library. Thank you, Devonport Library. We are so lucky to have had you, Selena. And there's more to come. Awesome. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you. All right, so I shall. You stay right there. Yours? Yours? Oh, did you turn around? I think I could have. Right, well, n n now I come into my main act. <laughs> um, that was just a little warm up back there. <laughs> um, and I wondered, of course, when I was uh, given this job of saying thank you to uh, Michelle and to Selena, uh, how I could do it. So I thought, well, this might be a time for me to be a thoroughly modern man and to use that digital modernism that we're all part of now. So I asked a few people over history what they thought of this poetry business. And a couple, of, a couple of thousand years ago, there was a guy called Socrates, and he decided that, uh, I decided that it was not wisdom that enabled poets to write their poetry, but a kind of instinct or inspiration, such as you find in seers and prophets who deliver all their sublime messages without knowing in the least what they mean. <laughs> well, he was, he was um, uh, four or five, four, three or four hundred years before the beginning of what's now known as, not AD, but the current era. He's BCE, right? About 500 years later than him, uh, a guy called Plutarch s still didn't know what the heck poetry was, so he he used another art form. He said, painting is silent poetry, and poetry is painting that speaks. So that's, that's not bad for a guy who lived to be 76, I thought, yeah. <laughs> And then coming into Europe, which by now was populated and civilised and so on, there was a man with the lovely name of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And Goethe said, personality is everything in art and poetry. <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a good poet, just have to have a nice personality. <laughs> he lived to be 83. Yes. And in the United Kingdom, which wasn't too united in the 18th century, um, there was a man called William Wordsworth who said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. <laughs> yes. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Yes, yes. He lived to be 80. Right? <laughs> and in Germany, 
uh, Rainer Maria Rilke said, if your daily life seems poor, don't blame it. Blame yourself that you're not poet enough to call forth its riches. <laughs> For the Creator, there is no poverty. Mm. He only lived to be 51. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in France, uh, Jean Cocteau said, as you might imagine a Frenchman saying, the poet is a liar who always speaks the truth. <laughs> he got to be 74. And Robert Frost, being a slightly more modern man, um, despite being, well, arriving at 76, said, a poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a love sickness. He's a good guy, yeah. And back in France, the, yes, there's still some wine on the table there, I see. Uh, Charles Baudelaire said, it's the hour to be drunken, to escape being the martyred slaves of time. Be ceaselessly drunk on wine, on poetry, or on virtue as you wish. <laughs> he only lived for 46 years. <laughs> A man that I never met, but whose name everybody knows, is Albert Einstein. And he said, pure mathematics is, in its way, the poetry of logical ideas. It's nice, 76 years old he was. Yeah. Um, but Gilbert Chesterton, better known as G.K., G.K. Chesterton said, the poets have been mysteriously silent on the subject of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so he made 62 years, yeah. Um, but Carl Sandburg, being a very good poet, not very highly regarded at the moment, but he did say, poetry is an echo asking a shadow to dance. Yeah. I like that, Aww. yeah. He lived to be 89, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy who wasn't good enough or too good for the United States. He migrated to London, became a publisher. And he said, immature poets imitate. Mature poets steal. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and he also said, as things are, and as fundamentally they must always be, poetry isn't a career, but a mugs game. <laughs> no honest poet can ever feel quite sure of the permanent value of what he has written. He may have wasted his time and messed up his life for nothing. I notice a certain gender bias in that uh, comment there, yeah. <laughs> Finally, we come to a couple of poets who were born after me. All these others have been born before me, but this guy was born in Canada, and his name was Cohen. Leonard Cohen said, I think the term poet is a very exalted term and should be applied to a man at the end of his work. When he looks back over the body of his work and his written poetry, then let the verdict be, that he's a poet. Okay. Or she. Well, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I, ne I nearly translated that into non-gendered <laughs> terms. They're all underlined here. <laughs> all, all the gender bias is underlined. But I thought I mustn't do that to the words of the great Leonard Cohen. In the presence of these two poets laureate. Yes, today. right. <laughs> and the... Um, Last quote is from that young guy who was born Robert Zimmerman but became known as Bob Dylan. And he said, and just remembering that he got the Nobel Prize in literature, right? I consider myself a poet first and a musician second. I live like a poet and I'll die like a poet. 
So there. So. It's very abyss oriented, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, ladies. And Olive. <laughs> yes. And I do hope you'll now have a glass of wine with us. I think there. you should. Thank yes. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd like to mention we're here on the poetry evening. Poet And we were recently in Sabah where there's a great poet. Well known. Robert Louis Stevenson. Yes. How much did he influence yourself and other people in Sabah? That's a really good question. I have a long story about my relationship with Robert Louis Stevenson because he shares the, the same name, right? Tusitala. And um, it was family rumour. Well, I've, I've since verified that he was most likely in the region of Tuvalu or what was then known as the Ellis Islands. He voyaged throughout those islands for three months around the time that my grandfather would have been born. And as makes sense to a people with an oral history, you name your environment, people, to mark historical occasions. So there's a whole generation of Tusitalas from Tuvalu and Samoa marking, I think, his entry there. But of course, we're, we kind of stand at opposite ends of the spectrum, right? But, but, but Stevenson agitated for Samoan independence from a New Zealand colonial administration and was almost placed under house arrest for it, you know. And um, so he's, he's always been um, a, a kind of a figure of influence in terms of how he behaved and how Samoans received him. Um, as a, and of course I grew up on Treasure Island and kidnapped and, you know, remarkable tales. But in that way, I think he's, he's um, influenced me the most. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wine and books. Yeah. Right. And signing. <laughs> and signing. And signing. Yes.